So uh, last time I was here, we spoke, to, we spoke about how disappointments tend to lead to doubt. If you keep on being disappointed by somebody, you start doubting whoever that person is, whatever that situation is, right? Uh, because your, your expectations go up, uh, and then they don't get fulfilled. Uh, you get disappointed, uh, and most of the time it leads to to doubt. Uh, we saw this in the life of Moses in, in our story uh, in Exodus. We saw this in the life of Moses in the life of the Israelites, right? Because of their high expectations from when Moses came to Egypt and showed them all the, the miracles and Aaron spoke the word of God uh, for them to be rejected uh, by Pharaoh and not just rejected, but uh, work added on to them, uh, being slaves already. Uh, it kind of broke their spirits. That's what it says in the, in the, in the scriptures. Uh, and that's why they, they can't believe what Moses is telling them uh, here at the end of chapter, or not at the end, at the, uh, in chapter 6, verse, uh, verse 9, because they're starting to doubt uh, God. Uh, Moses, at the end of chapter 5, started to doubt God. Um, and if you put yourself in their shoes... Uh, think about it. The Israelites have been waiting for salvation, for freedom, for how many years? Almost 400, even more than 400 years. And for them to be um, brought up, as far as their hopes are concerned, and then just dropped again because of rejection, because of, I guess, the, the hard heart of Pharaoh, um, how would you react? <laughs> like, how would you take it? Um, well, uh, as we saw from our scripture reading, uh, because of what happened, it led to uh, disappointment and then, uh, and then doubt. Um, so this led to Moses questioning God's goodness uh, to his people at the end of chapter 5. And then after speaking to God at the beginning of chapter 6, Moses once again spoke to the people of Israel. But the people, because of their broken spirit, uh, and what does it say? Because of their broken spirit and harsh slavery, did not believe. Right? They started doubting God. So last time I was here, that's what we talked about. Right? Uh, we talked about uh, what does God do, how does God respond to the doubt of Moses and the Israelites. It's found in uh, chapter 6, uh, beginning in verse 2, all the way to verse 8. Right? Uh, we took up the, you know, the first thing that God did and that God said in response to the doubt of the Israelites and Moses was what? To remind them of who he is. Right? Remember me? Remember me? I'm the God of Isaac. I'm the God of Abraham and Jacob. And uh, I am the Lord. He kept saying. God kept saying this. I am the Lord. I am the Lord. Remember me. Remember my character. Remember who I am. Uh, that's how God kind of shakes us out of that spirit of doubt. Uh, to, to remember who he is. Uh, remember how uh, he was in the past and how he brought you uh, to the present and how he will be in the future. Uh, let's remember that. Let's remember who God is. That's the first thing that, he, that God reminded the Israelites and reminded Moses of to help them overcome their, their doubt. The second thing that he, God reminds us or reminds Moses and the Israelites of are his promises. Uh, remember my covenant. I remember my covenant. Um, and that's what he said in, in, in the, um, the, those middle verses of chapter 6. Uh, he reminded them of their covenant and that this covenant is uh, continuous, let me say. Or uh, last time I was here, I said that it has no expiry date. Um, God will fulfill it uh, pretty much. That's what he was saying in the middle verses of chapter 6 again to help Moses and the Israelites overcome their doubts. Those are the first two things that God reminded them. Reminded them of who he is, reminded them of his promises and how faithful he is to fulfill them. Um, and then the third response, this is where we stopped last week, um, was uh, God saying the seven I wills. Remember? The seven I will statements found in uh, verses 2 to 5. Uh, so the I will statements of God are statements of guaranteed action on God's part. So first he said, this is me, I am God, I am faithful to my promises. 
This is what I will do. Right? Seven I will statements, guaranteed action on God's part. And I say guaranteed because, first of all, he starts off by saying, I am uh, the Lord. And again, this is the guarantee. That's the unshakable foundation of these statements. That it is God's character not to fail. He has never failed and he never will. So when he says, I will, that means we can take that to the bank. That he's going to actually do it. Uh, that we don't doubt that. That we shouldn't be shaky when it comes to our faith uh, in God's promises or his I will uh, statements. Uh, and again, I say that because we always hear these words, I will. Right? Remember I said this last time? You tell your kids, clean your room. What do they say? Yeah, I'll do that. Yeah, I'll do it. Right? Tell your people, oh, I'm going to meet you here at this time. What does your friend say? Yeah, I will. But it doesn't show up. <laughs> right? We're, we're so used to saying to these words, hearing these words, I will, but nothing gets done. That's why a lot of people are starting to doubt. Your parents doubt, you start doubting your kids that they will do that what they say what they're going to do. Uh, because we keep saying, I will, but don't actually do it. Um, but God is different. Uh, and I said this last week, God, when God says, I will, um, he, backs it up, he backs it up with his actual character, with his actual uh, uh, promises that he will accomplish these things. That he will do these things no matter what happens and therefore is the solid foundation and assurance of God's salvation when he says these I will statements he's not talking not just talking about the salvation of the Israelites he's talking about ours as well okay, if you notice it uh, and we'll go through that once I'm done with all these I will statements uh, so that we took up the first three I will statements okay um, Last time I was here, uh, the first two I will statements that we talked about is about how God will free the Israelites from slavery. Remember? I will redeem, I will uh, free you from slavery. I will take you out of Egypt. That's the, those are the first two I will statements. Talking about freedom, the freedom of God's salvation. Right? That's what it means to be saved by God is to be free. And I'm going to remind you that this freedom, don't get it twisted, is not for you to do what you want to do, but for us to do what God wants us to do with our lives as we continue to live in obedience to him. That's the freedom that God frees us to, right? to do what he wants us to do. Okay? Hopefully that is straight. Um, God frees us to be the people that he created us to be, or to be from the beginning, which is what? Fruit-bearing people. To be people who are being transformed from one degree of glory to another, and in the end, to become like Christ. That is the freedom that God frees us to. Right? Not to be who we want to be, but to be who he wants us to be. Right? Um, uh, the second thing that God will do, uh, when he says, I will, uh, and this is where we ended up last week, is I will redeem, right? Second part of verse 6 in chapter 6. <clears throat> Say, therefore, to the people of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from slavery to them. Okay, that's the freedom part. And then it says, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment okay this is where we ended up last week the last time i was here not last week and i said that redemption this idea of redeeming is actually a financial term right it's a financial term in the ancient marketplaces it was used to describe the release of a slave okay how was the slave released through a payment through a transaction from one slave owner to another it is a financial term. There is an exchange happening, a transaction happening. Right? And I said that if redemption is kind of like a transaction in financial terms, 
Then when you talk about a transaction, there's four key parts to a transaction. Uh, what are the four key parts again? The one who receives the payment, the one who pays, the one who is paid for, and what? Amount. How much? All right, if we're doing a transaction, those of you who, who post stuff on Marketplace or on Kijiji, that's what you do, right? I'm selling this. If you want this, you need to pay. So who are the players? The one who's buying, the one who's receiving the payment, the, one that, the thing that's getting paid for, and the cost, right? Um, and if you guys don't remember, uh, I used the illustration of the, the Exodus story uh, as as an illustration to, to show you guys what the transaction is. So as far as the Exodus story is concerned, again, who is the one that's being paid for? Who was being bought out? The Israelites. What was the cost to take them out of Egypt? What did God say that he will redeem them with? Great acts of judgment. It says there, right? I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. That's how he's going to get them out. The great acts of judgment. Who receives that payment? In the story of Exodus is the Egyptians. Because they were the ones who was holding the Israelites captive as slaves. Right? And who pays? Who paid that? God. God is the one who started all that, right? That's in Exodus. That's in the story of Exodus. Now, a lot of people, when we talk about salvation, their train of thought still remains with that, right? That God bought us back from somehow from Satan to redeem us, to save us from our, the penalty of our sins, but if you think about it, it doesn't work that way when it comes to salvation. Right? This is where I left you guys last week. When it comes to salvation, okay, I'm going to ask you the question again. Who is it that is being paid for? When it comes to our salvation, who is being paid for? Sinners. Us. What's the cost? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Cost is the blood of Jesus Christ. Right? That's the cost. Who pays the cost? We can say Jesus. We can say God the Father. Right? Now where we get into a... Some, some people get confused is who receives the payment. Right? This is where we end up last week. Who receives the payment for the cost of our salvation there's some people say Satan Satan say no it's not Satan I said that last week and if you read it yourself if you studied it you know it's not Satan then who is it God the Father again <clears throat> God the Father is the one who not only pays but also receives payment but why is that how does that work how do you explain that to people like how do you if somebody asks you What's the cost of your salvation? Oh, the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, that's right. Who paid? God the Father. His Father sent him. Who did he redeem you from? Or what did he redeem you from? What are you going to say? Who receives the payment? It's God the Father. Right? How does it work? That's what we're going to take up for the rest of my time today. Okay, how does that work? Who receives the payment for our redemption? First, <clears throat> if you know the story of the fall, okay, mankind was not only was not really forced to sin against God. Okay? They were tempted, but they weren't forced. It's not like how Satan put a gun to Eve's head and say, eat the apple or whatever it is, the forbidden fruit. Uh, so we weren't really forced. Just like the, um, the prodigal son. Was he kicked out of his father's household? No. Prodigal son left 
on his own. Right? Same with mankind. The fall was totally our fault or Adam and Eve's fault. They sinned or they fell into sin because of their own decisions. And ever since then, all humans that came after them were slaves to sin. That's why we all have sinful nature. Right? Um, I guess it's the doctrine of original sin, some people call it. Right? That's why we all have sinful nature, because of Adam and Eve. But they weren't kidnapped. <laughs> A lot of times when we see redemption, we you know, equate it with the ransom. When we hear ransom, we think kidnap. We never got kidnapped. We left on our own. As, as far as human beings are concerned, Adam and Eve left on their own decision. And because of them, because of their fall, everyone, all human beings that came after them were now slaves to sin. So now, if that's the case, if our slavery to sin that got passed down from Adam and Eve to us, for lack of a better word, that was a voluntary thing that they did, okay, they decided on their own to disobey God and therefore sin against God, that means that the only thing that is holding us captive today is our own sinful nature. Do you agree with that? There's really nobody holding us captive other than our own sinful nature. That's why every time we get tempted, we can't just say, the devil's fault. It's Satan's fault. No, you have something to do with it, too. Right? Because we have this sinful nature in us, and we want to do that. The devil sometimes don't even have to convince us. We just do it. Right? Right? Do you agree with that? Or are you guys like all holy inside and oh, Satan has to really convince you? No. Sometimes you just sankalabit lang. <laughs> right? Because we all have sinful natures right? that got passed down from Adam and Eve, and that's what's holding us captive. Now, if that's the case, then for God to redeem us, he must pay the cost to the one whom we owe. You get that? For God to redeem us, he must pay for us to who? To the one whom we are owing to. Who do we owe? Right? That's what you have to think about. Who do we owe because of our sinful nature? And that's who God has to pay, okay, to redeem us back. To get us back. Right? The question is, who is that? <laughs> who do we owe? Because of our sins. Well, none other than God himself. Okay. That's all you're saying. Jesus, we owe Jesus. No, we got we to gotta, we gotta separate this. Okay? We got to have some, com com some kind of compartmentalization of who God the Father is and who Jesus Christ is. They're not the same, <laughs> okay? They're different. You don't owe Jesus because he paid. No, God sent him as payment. But it's God who paid. Is that clear? So if God is the one who we owe, then he's the one who receives payment, right? Because he's the one that we owe because of our sinful nature. Now, why? how does that work? Uh, check out Psalm 51. <clears throat> Psalm 51 is a very popular psalm. This is David's prayer of repentance, right? In Psalm 51, okay, David's prayer of repentance, uh, he wrote this, um, well, after committing the murder and the, 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 the adultery with Bathsheba and the murder of Bathsheba's husband, um, to cover it all up, David was confronted by Nathan, the prophet, in Samuel, uh, 2 Samuel. Before that, David didn't care. <laughs> he wasn't repentant. But after, Sam, uh, after Nathan confronted him, then he began to realize, oh yeah, I have sinned. I have done, I have done something bad. 
I've sinned against. Well, against who? Um, after being uh, confronted and awakened of these uh, sins, David wrote this psalm, uh, a prayer of repentance. When we, let's read the first part, and then t you tell me who David sinned against. Is it Bathsheba and Uriah or somebody else? Check it out. It says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sins. Again, he's talking about his sin of adultery and murder, right? Keep going. For I know my transgressions and my sin is before me. And then verse 4, look at that. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Stop there. So what is David trying to say? That he never sinned against Bathsheba and he never sinned against Uriah? Is that what he's trying to say? That, that, that the murder and the adultery uh, against those people weren't counted as sins against those people. It was just counted as sins against God. That he never really sinned against people. He just sinned against God. Is, he, is that what he's trying to, to say? Right? Because he says, against you, you only have I sinned. So obviously... That can't mean that he never sinned against Bathsheba or Uriah. But ultimately, okay, the reason why it's sin is because it was done against God. Do you get what I'm saying? The reason why sin is sin is because it is done against God. Same goes for us. When we do bad or evil things or sinful things, the reason they are wrong is because of God. Okay, what does that mean? God being creator and judge was the one who set the standard for what is right and what is wrong. He's the one who laid out all the rules. That's why if you break one of those things, those rules, not only do you sin against uh, your husband or your wife when it comes to adultery, your brother when it comes to murder, but ultimately, you sin against the one who created the rules. And that is God himself. Right? He is the standard, or he's the one who set the standard for what is right and what is wrong. And the reason why lying and murder and stealing is wrong is because God says so. And when we commit acts that are wrong in God's eyes, ultimately, even though other human beings can and will be hurt by our actions, it is ultimately God whom we have sinned against. Is that clear? Right? But that doesn't mean that it's just God. If you commit adultery, you sin against your spouse as well. They're, the, they're the, the victims of your sin, but ultimately you sinned against God. So if that's the case, when it comes to our redemption, the payment for our offense is offered and received by God himself because he's the one who ultimately affect who was ultimately affected by our own sinfulness and it is his justice that needs to be satisfied you guys you guys understand that it is god's justice that needs to be satisfied in the end that's why he receives payment okay another explanation on why god is the one that not only pays but receives payment for our redemption. Check out Romans 3, 21 to 26. 3.21. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. To what? The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there is no distinction for all have fallen short, or for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And this is the verse that I want you to focus on. Whom God put forward, or put forth, as a, 
Can you read that word? Propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he has passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. And again, can you show verse 25 again, please? In verse 25, who is the one who determined the cost of our redemption? God himself, right? Who put forward a propitiation by his blood? And when you talk about his, that's the blood of Jesus, not the blood of God. Okay? Let's, let's, let's keep it straight, right? Put forth by us a propitiation by his blood. So if God determined, is the one who determined the cost to buy us back. Why is it him? Because he's the one we owe. Do you get that? We owe him because of our sins. And he's the one who says, okay, uh, because you sin, you have to pay this. But really, when you think about this, this is already gospel right here. This is already good news. But what really should have happened is because of that word, propitiation, okay, the only thing that could satisfy, that's what that propitiation means, that's what that word means, is to satisfy a God or a deity. Okay? To satisfy the anger of a God or a deity. The only thing that could satisfy that is the cost that he gave. Okay? Because we could say that God can be just as just if he just killed everybody. Wouldn't that be the same thing? Because we're all sinners, right? And in front of a holy God, he can't stand sinners. He's angry at sin. And with him, remember when I said this, with God, he's extreme. Doesn't matter how, what sin you committed, if, even if he's just lying, the penalty is always what? Eternal death, right? So if that's the case, if he just killed everybody, he'd still be just. Amen? Do we agree? He would still be just, right? Because the penalty for the, the, the sin has been, quote unquote, paid for. Everybody dies. But because of his grace, he changed the cost. Instead of everybody dying, which he promised never to do again, remember? In, in Noah's story. He changed the cause. Now what is it that will satisfy, propitiate God's anger, God's wrath because of sin? Only one thing. Right? God determined the cost for that. And the cost, he paid himself. And that is to put forward or give his only son, Jesus Christ, as the propitiation to satisfy his justice, to satisfy his anger. So Romans 3.25 says that in order to satisfy God's justice so that the penalty for our sin, which is to receive God's wrath, because he is the one whom we sinned against, the only way to satisfy that wrath or to make peace with that wrath is through the blood of Christ. Clear? It's like when you, when you commit a speeding ticket, depends on how fast you were going or how much over the speed you're going. Like the penalty is different, right? Sometimes you can just get away with it. Uh, sometimes I've been penalized like $300 for speeding, right? Some, some, if you speed over 50, they take your car away, <laughs> right? What determines that cost to pay for your quote-unquote sin? The sin that you committed, <laughs> right? But with God, it's different. It doesn't matter what 
It doesn't matter if you were speeding. It doesn't matter if you're lying. It doesn't matter if you look bad at somebody. If you think bad of somebody, that's already it. And the cost is always, or sorry, the, the penalty is always death. But because of God's grace, he said, you know what? Even if you all die, not going to satisfy my wrath. The only thing that can satisfy it is through the sacrifice of Jesus. The sacrifice of his only son. Again, God's justice is extreme. And he's saying no matter how small or big, penalty is always death. And not just physical, but eternal death. And that's what we owe God because of our sins. But God so loved that instead of laying the penalty, the penalty on us, God determined the cost of our redemption. So what happened after the fall is because all of mankind has sinned against God, the only thing that will satisfy his justice is sacrificial blood. But not man's sacrificial blood. Not good enough. Only the blood of his own son is good enough. That's the gospel. Do you, guys, do you guys feel the weight of what God did in redemption? If somebody sinned against you, right, you'd want payback, right? It's just human nature. It's payback. That's why you get angry when somebody cuts you off you know, or they took my lane. Sin against you. You want payback. But with God, even though, yes, he wanted payback and he needed payback because if he didn't get, ask for payback, if he didn't ask for justice, he wouldn't be God. But because of his love, great love, he said that, you know what? I'll pay it myself. Because you can't. You can't pay it. You can't. None of us can I was what one time um, Eli, uh, when he was first driving, um, tried to park in a, in a school. I think he was picking up your, your kids. And he hit somebody. <laughs> it was, I think, two weeks into getting his license or uh, a little something like that. And he hit somebody. Um, because he's, you know, when you're a new driver, you try to park and you park so fast. Like, you know, you don't even care. There's cars around or whatever. Anyways, he hit somebody. So we came down hard on him. Next time, you know, don't do that. I'll take your license away. Slowly get in. Slowly pull up. Slowly park. Why do you have to rush parking anyway? So we came down hard on him. Did he deserve it? Yes. It's because he messed up. At the same time, if he kept doing that, not only will he... Not just hit somebody, probably run over somebody. <laughs> right? So he deserved that. Two weeks later or a month later, um, he's driving the car. Him and Caleb, Caleb beside him, they were playing around. And because they were playing around, this guy hit the sidewalk with one of the tires. Blew up the tire. Okay? Good thing they were five minutes away from home that they could still drive home. But with the tire blown up. So both of them comes in. Ah, uh, Dad, we messed up again. What did you do this time? Oh, we were driving, blah, 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 blah. We were playing around, and I hit the sidewalk, and I blew your tire on a brand new car. Doesn't he deserve worse? Because this was, this was not just parking. They were playing around. You shouldn't be doing that. If you're driving, you should keep your eyes on the road. But at that point, I was like, you know what? You didn't learn the first time when I came down hard on you. Maybe I'll show some grace. Okay, I'll pay for the tire. But just make sure you don't do that again. Did he deserve that? No. <laughs> but
but you still give. As a parent, I feel like if you just keep on, you know, no, 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 rules, 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 and show no grace, then I don't want God to treat me like that as a father. <laughs> right? But because God is gracious, even though, yeah, we still sin every sing- single day. But because of his grace, now that grace isn't free, by the way. It was paid for by God himself through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. But still, if we don't see that when it comes to knowing God, we'll never really feel the weight of our salvation. Because that's what that is. That's what salvation is. That's why it's so good news. Even though it's all our fault, somebody else took the blame and took the penalty for it. And when we think about it, it was all God. God determined the cost. God paid the cost. God received payment and considered the payment enough to satisfy his justice and wrath. If God said, you know what, since I'm the judge, I don't think this is enough payment, then nobody will be saved. Nobody. But because he's the one who said, no, this is the cost, and because you can't pay it, I will, by sending my own son to pay the penalty, then I'm going to deem that as worthy to satisfy, propitiate, then those who believe in him will get or will be saved. Amen? You still look like you're... That's good news. That's good news. And think about how, what, what it's like on God's part to do that. I only paid for a tire. <laughs> Imagine if you have to give up one of your kids <laughs> or your only son. That's a lot. But did God do it? Yeah. Why? Because he promised to. From the beginning of Genesis, he promised to do that. And that's why when you look at these I will statements, it should help you get over whatever doubt you have when it comes to God's character. When it comes to who God is and what he's willing to do. Because he was willing to do that. I just determine the cost, but pay for it. And then deem that payment as satisfying his justice and his wrath. Now what God wants us to do to get on that, is to see Jesus as the same. If you see Jesus as worthy, precious, treat him as your greatest treasure, if you see him for that, then you're seeing him through God's eyes. If you only see Jesus as a ticket to heaven, then you're not seeing him through God's eyes. Because the only way that God approved of this sacrifice is because he deemed Jesus as that worthy. Do you get what I'm saying? That Jesus was enough. And he wants us to see him the same way for us to be saved. If you don't see that, if you treat Jesus as a, as a genie, Okay, I'll, I'll accept the Lord Jesus Christ so that I can get what I want. I'll accept the Lord Jesus Christ so that he'll save me from sickness. I'll accept the Lord Jesus Christ so that he will answer my prayer for a job. I'll accept the Lord Jesus Christ so that, uh, you know, I can finally get my, find my girlfriend or my boyfriend. No. God said, for you to be saved, you have to see Jesus as I see Jesus. That he is worthy, that he is enough to satisfy Penalty for the sins that we committed. That's salvation. That's what it means to be saved by faith. Amen? You guys understand that? We can't just treat Jesus as, you know, a little baby that comes every Christmas. Or, you know, somebody to, 
you know, speak a word, good word for us to God so that God will answer our prayers. We have to see Jesus in God's eyes, the way God sees Jesus. And that's the only way to be saved. That's, the, that's what it means to be saved by faith. And, and again, that's, that's gospel. Right? That's the good news. The only way you're going to see Jesus as that if it's God awakens some, something in you to see it. And it is through him as well. By grace, through faith, that we see Jesus that way. So not only does uh, God free us from slavery to sin, but he also redeemed us. And he redeemed us by his grace, effectively buying us back to himself. How? Through the payment of his own son's blood. Is it clear? Is that clear? That's redemption. Right? As, as simple as I can put it. That's redemption. Good news is, God's redemption does not stop there. Because remember, I also said this. Because of God's redemption, we who believe has now been freed from slavery to sin to become what? Slaves to righteousness. What's so good about that? From one slavery to another. Good thing about that is, now we have a different owner. We have a different slave owner. Being redeemed by God means that even though we are called slaves to righteousness, we are not treated as slaves, but as sons and daughters. That means that the purpose for God's redemption is not just to pay the cost of our freedom, but guess what? He also paid cost, the cost for our adoption. Okay? Didn't just pay for the cost of our freedom. He paid for the cost of our adoption. That's the next I will statement that we're going to take up early next year. <laughs> Big topic, uh, adoption. Um, a lot of us, we don't relate adoption to our salvation. That's why we see God as just this angry God who's just waiting for us to mess up and then he will punish us and, and penalize us and, and take away our jobs. And <laughs> That's not God. God is a loving father, right? Remember that song? Good, good. Good, good father. And the only reason why he became our father is because he adopted us. That's the next I will statement that we're going to check out. Hopefully, um, you can come back and join us next year for that. Uh, but for now, I just want you to take in the weight of that cost and what it paid for and why it is that, why it is that God is the one who receives payment. It is through his grace that he did that. Right? It's not being a, a unfair or it's not being a unjust. It's just, that's who he is. And by his grace, he structured, designed, or whatever, however you want to call it, salvation to be that. He's the one who pays. Starts with God, ends with God. He's the one who determined the cost, paid the cost, received payment. It's all God. Amen? Amen. It's all about on our hands this prayer.